I hope everyone's having a good time. I hope everyone's uh, enjoying the weekend so far. I know I am. As we uh, begin, I just want to pray as Pastor, Pastor Don asked for our young people and also for us as we uh, continue on this evening. Gracious God in heaven, thank you that we can meet here, your people. Father, we thank you for your work in our hearts. We thank you for your work here in our church as we hear of uh, three young people pursuing Jesus Christ and making him known. We thank you for them. We thank you for your work in their hearts, Lord. Um, we pray your blessing to them, as, as Pastor Don said, for their, for their courage and their boldness in Jesus Christ in, in the local schools and uh, their burden uh, to see people come to faith. Their burden um, to make Jesus Christ known. We thank you for that. We pray for Jacob and for Lauren as they do uh, work with Young Life. And we pray for Cassie as your hand is upon her to direct her. Uh, she's seeking uh, training and now direction where you would lead her uh, to serve you full time, Lord. Uh, thank you for them. We do pray now, God, that uh, as we continue on, as we think about the great mission that you've given to us, your people, as we meet now and consider that, God, we earnestly desire that you would make us a church hungry for you and hungry for the mission of God. So as we think about these things, Lord, we pray uh, your blessing uh, to all that would take place, God. We ask that it would be uh, to the glory and to the praise of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So I don't know, a picture says a thousand words. I'm not sure how many words uh, videos are worth, but uh, I couldn't drag all of you down to, uh, to Spencer Smith Park, so I figured the, the video was the best way uh, to give you a bit of a taste of, of, uh, of what happens down there and uh, to let you know that despite our, our world, despite our culture, God is doing great things. God is doing amazing things in Burlington. Um, that group that you saw singing um, is not the Go Team. It's a different group. Uh, we're together in Christ. Uh, their particular gifting is to sing. That's not mine. Um, but there's 40, 50, 20-somethings on a Friday night giving their time to worship and to praise Jesus Christ. It's absolutely amazing. So that's going on just down the road here in Burlington. So I wanted to encourage you uh, with that. Um, so that's what a typical night looks like uh, on the GO team. GO stands for, for Gospel Outreach, and that's what we do. We go, we pray, uh, we hand out gospel tracts, we give out Bibles, we give out biblical literature, um, and we preach. And the hymn sing group sings, and it's, uh, it's an incredible atmosphere uh, down there in the park. It's, it's like the church has left the building and, and gone outside, and, um, and that's the reason we go. Uh, we go because, uh, honestly... We're in a post-Christian culture, and people, people don't come. Uh, very rarely now will someone come into a church um, and hear a gospel message. Uh, so we go to them uh, because they're not coming to us. Um, so I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to share here. Uh, Global Missions has asked me to share a little bit about uh, how I got involved in this type of ministry, how God called me, uh, gifted me, equipped me, sort of brought me uh, to the GO team, and... Um, just uh, what that's all about. So um, along with every session that we've had, um, I mean, it's great to hear about uh, what's going on in, in different ministries. And you might think, what, is, what does the GO team really, really have to do with me? But um, as was mentioned downstairs earlier, uh, my hope is that as you think about these things, it'll just be more, more than information about, about what someone else is doing. But uh, you'll keep in the back of your mind, how does this apply to me? Um, what is God teaching me uh, through this time? Uh, what's God calling me to do? What's God calling me to change in, in the way that I'm living or uh, what have you? So I'd like to uh, just read from Matthew uh, chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, Matthew 4 in verse 19. Um, if you're here with us in Pineland and not visiting last week, uh, we had a guest preacher who, who preached on uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, where the Lord Jesus Christ is ascending into heaven, and, and his sort of last 
uh, repetition of, of the Great Commission, and, and he says that, um, that uh, the disciples will be his witnesses uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So that was the end of Christ's ministry, and I want to just go back to the beginning of, of Christ's ministry, um, where he says essentially the same thing. It's interesting to see uh, the book ends. In Matthew 4 and verse 19, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So we see unmistakably that the call to Christ, the call to follow Christ, is a, is a call to missions. There's really no escaping that. Jesus says, Follow me, and I will, I will make you fishers of men. The call to come to Christ is a call to fish for souls. So right off the hop, I'm not saying that uh, everyone's going to be involved in street ministry. Most definitely not. More than likely, probably not. Um, But there is a specific call to every believer in Jesus Christ uh, to be on mission for him. You see, the how and the where is unique, um, but the call is universal. So by a show of hands, some involvement here, who's following Jesus Christ? I hope everyone's going to have their hand up. Anyone who's not going to zone in on you. Just kidding. (laughs) Um, So everyone's following Jesus Christ. So we have a room full of missionaries, right? Amen. We have a room full of missionaries. You might not have thought of it that way, but that is the reality for those who follow Jesus Christ, that we are on mission for him. So the the heart-searching question I want to ask you now is, where are you fishing? Where are you fishing? So just for a little bit of background about myself, um, I didn't get saved until uh, later in life. I grew up attending a Catholic church, and um, we certainly didn't observe the teaching of the Catholic church. We didn't even really know what it was, uh, but we attended. And uh, I certainly didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ as my Savior. Um, I do have some fond memories, though. Um, After the brief 30-minute or so Mass, we'd head downstairs and Every week there'd be a big buffet breakfast. Uh, so I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the all-you-could-eat breakfast. But, but after that, it was just uh, continue on your way, live your life. Um, there was no prayer. There was no Bible reading. There was no uh, talking about God. There was no relationship with God whatsoever. And as I got older, I drifted away from, from even attending church. And as uh, lost people do, I lived my life a dead in sin for many years. So fast forward a few years, my wife and I, Christina, are married, and uh, we moved next door to this Christian family. And, um, you know, things were great. We thought life was grand. Uh, We were healthy, young, married. We had good jobs. But little did we know that God was about to uh, turn our world upside down. You see, over the next five years, God would crush me and crush Christina and convict us of our sin. First... God did that by allowing us to have a miscarriage, and then a second, and then a third, and then a fourth. And God used that physical suffering to get our attention in the spiritual. See, through that time, I could not escape the thought of God. I could not escape the weight of my own sin. I felt so low. I felt as if I couldn't even approach God. I couldn't even pray and ask God for anything. I could only say thank you for that particular day. I could hear, as it were, the voice of the enemy. What a hypocrite. All your life, you wanted nothing to do with God. And now, now you want to come to him? This is only because you have your own selfish desires in it. This is because you want children, you see? But God continued to draw me to himself, and he humbled me to the point where that I knew That God owed me nothing, and I was okay with that. The only thing God owed me was wrath. He certainly didn't owe me any children. And after he broke me, I began to understand his grace. And the Christian family who lived next door were now our best friends. And they had been patiently ministering to us. They'd been praying for us for probably seven years, sharing the gospel with us repeatedly. We were stubborn. (laughs) There was much more going on than just fertility issues. There was a great spiritual work being done in our lives, and uh, there was physical healing as we eventually went on to have three children. But the greatest miracle was the spiritual healing that God did in our hearts. 
When Jesus healed the blind man in John chapter 9, he says, It was not that this man sinned or his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in his life. So as painful as those five years were, and they were terrible, I am so thankful for them because God used it to display his glorious work in our lives. We were blind, and now we see. I was born again on May, in May in 2012. So now, Christina knows this, and maybe a few other people that know me a little well. Uh, I have a, just a tad bit of OCD. Now, if uh, it translates into, if I'm going to be doing something, I, I'm all in. It doesn't really matter what it is. I kind of go right at it. Uh, years ago, I, I, I took up hunting, and it wasn't enough to just go hunting uh, and be into archery. I had to you know, know all the ins and outs of, of archery and, and bow hunting and began to make my own arrows, fetch my own arrows, make my own broadheads, and then before you know it, uh, we're in the woods and we're cutting down the tree and we're splitting the tree. We're making our own bow and arrow out of the tree. You see? That's, that's what happens with me. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, gardening. Take up a little bit of vegetable gardening. Before you know it, there's 250 plants under lights in my living room. That's just, that's how it goes. So as a brand new baby in Christ, I jumped right in. I was so hungry to learn about God. I had so many questions. I had so many misconceptions uh, from a loose Catholic upbringing. Um, and Dan, my neighbor, who was the one who shared Christ with me, my best friend, he, he bought me a Bible, took me down to the Christian bookstore, bought me an NIV life application study Bible. And he stressed, this is so important in your Christian life. You need to be connected to this. Now, I don't say this to boast of myself. This was not, this was not me. Um, before I was a Christian, I never read. I read maybe six books in my whole life. Um, this was of God. And God gave me such an appetite from his, for his word that I, I just couldn't, I couldn't feed enough. At the time, we didn't have children, and I was working shift work, and Christina was working full time, so I'd come home from work, and I'd grab the NIV study Bible, and I would read for hours and hours. And uh, again, this was the work of the Lord. And I, I couldn't put it down. I read every verse and every note in that study Bible in three months. As Peter said, I long for the word like a baby does for its mother's milk. And the more time I spent with Christ and his word and, his, and in prayer, the, the clearer it, be, it became that the implications of the gospel and the call for those who believe. So Mark 17 is a parallel, sorry, Mark chapter 1, verse 17, is a parallel of the passage that I just read. And um, Mark adds the word become. He says, uh, Jesus says there, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. You see, this is not a, a natural skill set for the disciples. It wasn't a natural skill set for me. It wasn't uh, something that I was, that I was born with. Um, Jesus didn't pick those who already had skills and already had ability, but he, he chose those that he would transform as they followed him. So as I began to read the Bible, God began to renew my mind and my, and my thinking, and he gave me a simple and clear trust for his word. He gave me new desires and a passion for making Christ known. And because the gospel is true, it changes everything. Everything about our lives changes. Our desires, our values, our direction, everything. How could it not? And then after I read the Bible through, I began a, a different reading plan called the Grant Horner Reading Plan. It's, it's many chapters a day uh, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, lots of gospel, and, and uh, particularly the book of Acts. You read one chapter of the book of Acts every day. So you're reading the book of Acts once a month, 12 times a year. So I was on that plan for a year and a half, and I read the book of Acts 18 times. And that greatly affected my understanding of missions and, uh, and how we're to go about it. So as I think back, it was, it was really this time in communion with God, in his word and in prayer, that, that grew my heart for the Great Commission and, uh, and my call to serve him. So Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. As we follow Jesus into his word and we spend time with him, the result is he makes us fishers of men. See, our role in missions, in the mission of God, will be directly proportionate to our communion with Christ in his word and in prayer. If you find your heart cold towards missions, 
Seek communion with Christ. Follow him. A five-minute devotional will not launch you into Christ's mission. It's just not possible. That's following Jesus from a mile back. And if we would be useful, we need to follow closely at his side. And this has been so true in my own life. If there's ever been a time when my spiritual life has gone awry, undoubtedly there is a connection to the word and to prayer and my lack of it. So my call to missions was really very, very simple. As I followed Christ and learned from him against everything in my flesh, and my flesh fought hard, I could not shake this. Two things. How could I believe the gospel and not share it? How could I follow Jesus and not do what he says? Now, maybe you've heard of, uh, of Penn Gillette. He's sort of a magician slash comedian, and he's, he's kind of become a bit of an outspoken atheist in the, in the last uh, number of years. Well, Penn tells this story about a man who approached him after one of his shows, and he, he comes up to him and he, and he says, I've got something for you, Penn. You know, I really enjoyed your show. Thank you for, for all that you've done, but I've, I've got a little book here for you, and I wrote in the, in the front of it, and I want to give it to you. Don't worry, I'm not crazy. I'm a businessman. Here you go. And he gave him a little New Testament with, with the Psalms. And Penn recalls, you know what? He was kind. He was nice. He was sane. He looked me in the eye, and he, he talked to me, and he gave me this Bible. And he says this. I've always said, I don't respect people who don't evangelize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there's a heaven and a hell, and people will be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not really worth telling them because it would be socially awkward, I mean, how much do you have to hate someone not to evangelize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? Now, this is a professing atheist. But he rightly recognizes the massive inconsistency of a Christian who will not witness. And this is the burden that was laid on me. I just could not shake it. If I believe the gospel, I must share it. It was massively inconsistent for me to believe the gospel and to not share it. If Jesus Christ is Lord, how could I refuse his commands? And everyone I knew was an unbeliever. My family, my friends, my co-workers... Every single person that I ever laid eyes on would spend eternity in heaven or in hell. There will be a resurrection of life, and there will be a resurrection of judgment. And as sure as believers will be raised to eternal life with Christ, those who never hear and those who reject Christ will be raised to everlasting judgment in a lake of fire. How in the world could I be worried about what people think of me? In light of eternity. Every excuse I had, I had lots of excuses to not speak up. They were all self-centered and self-serving. I had to die to self. For Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So initially, God gave me a great burden for people. That not one would go to hell. Charles Spurgeon says, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. And let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. And while the burden for souls in light of eternity is right, it's it's a biblical motivation. On its own, it can can tend to be unbalanced if it's not kept in check by by the ultimate motivation, uh, the glory of God. So the glory of God must be our ultimate motivation for faithful and enduring ministry. When God called Ezekiel to speak to to his nation, he flat out told Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. I'm sending you to them, and they will not listen to you. But he still went. He still went. See, if if it was solely uh, that people would turn to the Lord, Ezekiel wouldn't have prevailed. He He would have burnt out. So the glory of God and the purposes of God must be above our our right motives and desires that, that people would be saved. So in regards to gifting, Jesus says, I will make you fishers, and then he will do it. And those that God calls, he gifts. So this is a work of God. And to prove it, God uses the most unlikely people, 
right? He does that to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and, and not to us. So Moses didn't want to speak. He didn't want to lead the people. Jeremiah was the same. He said, I can't speak. He said, I'm too young, right? The disciples, uneducated, unqualified men. The Apostle Paul's speech was, and his presence was underwhelming, uh, you know. See, God will use the most unlikely people in the most unexpected ways. And that's what he did with me. I didn't like reading. I didn't like crowds. I didn't like cities. I didn't like talking to strangers. And I hated public speaking. Like, I despised public speaking. Didn't want to make a speech at my wedding. My mom had to twist my arm. Okay, so what does God do? He leads me into a ministry where reading is essential, where we go into the cities, we seek out crowds, and we public speak to them. That's what he did. So as I followed Christ, he gifted me. And as you follow Christ, he will gift you. Remember what God said to Moses when he called him. Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will teach you what you shall speak. He says to Jeremiah, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. God knows our tendency to be fearful. I was so fearful. I wanted to go and I wanted to tell people about Christ, but I was so scared. If I could only find someone to go with me and, and, and help me, maybe that would be a bit, bit better, you know, right? But that was proving difficult as I, as I quickly learned that uh, a proactive biblical evangelism is, is not very common. Sad to say. So there are churches on every corner, but not much local outreach going on. My guess is that most churches in North America are more faithful in global missions than in local missions. Because most evangelical churches will support global missionaries, but most do not engage in local missions. So I began to pray that God would somehow steer me to someone that could help me. So believe it or not, God redeems things. God redeems social media. Believe it or not, I found someone on social media who was into this type of thing, but he was in like, he was in England. So one day I'm on Twitter and I find out this guy's coming to London, but not London, England, London, Ontario. I'm like, I gotta go get in the car. This guy knows what's going on. He's going he's gonna to show me the ropes. So I go to London, Ontario, and uh, I drive out there with Dan, my neighbor, the one who led me to the Lord, and we're so excited, super scared, and I find out that this guy has come to meet another group that meets there every single Friday, like 25 people, uh, ages 20 to maybe 35, 40. I said, That's it. I'm coming back. I'm coming back every Friday. So, but I remember my first conversation um, a young guy, a skateboarder guy, and just swallowed my pride and started a conversation with him. It was much easier because there was a crowd of people. And, and uh, if we didn't talk for like 45 minutes, and the guy opened up and we had a great conversation, it was just palpable, the presence of, of God in that situation. And from that point on, I was just like, wow, so much so much easier than, than I ever uh, even really Im- imagined. So I connected with the Cross Current, that, uh, that ministry uh, in London uh, that trains local churches and, and equips them. And there was two gentlemen there, Jeff Mardling and Corey McKenna. And as I went there every Friday for about a year, year and a half, um, they took me and were gracious with me and gave me opportunities and sort of modeled for me... Uh, a faithful, loving street witnessing. Not the street witnessing that you see on YouTube. Not the angry, yelling, screaming, condemning people. But a faithful, loving, biblical evangelism. Um, so I'm very thankful for them and, and uh, their, uh, their part and their role in my life. And then for my church family here, the leadership here was, was very supportive of me and, and, and encouraged that. And then um, myself and Pastor Nate went on a, a, a weekend-long training um, campaign that they had for the Cross Current called Church Champions with the idea of taking that same local outreach model and bringing it back uh, to your home church. So that's what happened. Um, the GO team was, was born in, uh, in spring of 2013 here at Pineland Baptist uh, Church. So it's a local ministry um, from the church 
with really the desire to be faithful to the Great Commission by going out into the community and, and advancing uh, the gospel. So we do that as each one has, has gifted, uh, been gifted um, through tracts, through booklets, through handing out Bibles, and, and through preaching. Not everyone does every aspect of that. Um, so as it, as it began, it was just myself. And then within a few months, providentially, there was a young man, a tall man who's sitting right there, Matt. And he connected with the same gentleman, Corey McKenna, and says, I have the same desire uh, to witness to people in my community. Um, he had heard Corey talking to conference, and he says, I live in Burlington. Is there anyone around that can, that can uh, join with me in that? And he says, well, I just so happened to, to know Kevin, who just started a, a local outreach out of Pineland. And so the Lord graciously uh, brought Matt Templeman into the group early on uh, because I was still very nervous and fearful to go on my own. And um, so the group, since then, the group has, has grown. Uh, we've had many people come through, but we've got a core group of about uh, six to eight people and then a more semi-regular um, laborers, another maybe eight or ten or so. Um, but again, like I said, there's been many people that have served uh, throughout, the, throughout the years um, in our weekly outreaches as well as uh, there's a lot of events that come to Burlington, Ribfest, uh, The Sound of Music, uh, we did the Grey Cup in Toronto. We did the Grey Cup in Ottawa. And the Lord has really blessed us with incredible unity and, and freedom uh, to preach Christ every Friday in, in both Hamilton and, uh, and Burlington. Like I said, we're in Spencer Smith Park when the weather's good. When the weather turns cold, uh, we are in Hamilton uh, at Jackson Square just because we've got to go where the people are. Uh, we, need, we need fish to fish. <laughs> So the Go Team believes that, um, that Jesus calls us to fish and that he also tells us how uh, to fish. So in other words, the Bible gives us the message and it also gives us the method of evangelism. So uh, this uh, results in, in some distinctives that are, that are kind of unique to this type of ministry. And I just want to quickly highlight a couple of them for you. Is, so the first thing is, is we use God's law in evangelism. Uh, meaning, uh, generally speaking, we talk about the bad news before we talk about the good news. Uh, we need to know that we have the disease uh, before we understand the need for a cure. So the law is good, if we use it lawfully, to bring the knowledge of sin, to stop the mouth, and to lead us like a guardian, as Galatians says, to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So when we examine the scriptures, we see that there's a general evangelistic uh, framework of of law and grace. A law to the proud and grace to the humble. So this is what Jesus did when a proud lawyer approaches Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? He gives them four of the Ten Commandments. But when a humble person approaches Jesus, they receive grace. He says, go your way, your faith has made you well. So with a proud, self-righteous person, we don't lead off with God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. We might get there, but we don't lead off with that. We establish the foundation first, and a man must realize first that he's utterly lost before he will be saved. He must be broken before he's healed. So a second uh, sort of distinction um, that we have is, is it's a ministry of proclamation. We believe that the gospel is the power of God to salvation and that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. When God's word goes out, it will not return void. Now, believe it or not, this is probably the most controversial point in this particular uh, ministry, especially in uh, open-air preaching. Uh, we often receive comments, um, even from professing believers, that, uh, that we're doing it wrong, that we should not be preaching the gospel, and uh, what, we're, what we're doing is, in fact, pushing people away from Jesus. Well, the Bible says the exact opposite. It says that it pleased God through the, fo- through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So from Noah to the prophets to John the Baptist to Jesus Christ himself, the apostles, like it or not, open-air preaching is thoroughly biblical. Jesus was an open-air preacher. He sent his disciples out to preach, and he commanded that the gospel be proclaimed to the nations. Now, this is by no means the only method, but it is a valid biblical method of evangelism. And it's something that we engage in from time to time. So we trust in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit and the sovereignty of God in salvation. Another distinctive of, 
of what the Go team is about. We urgently call people to come to faith. We plead with them, and then we let the Spirit do his work. Because salvation is of the Lord, we don't manipulate people, we don't pressure people into decisions, and we don't lead them in a repeat-after-me type of a sinner's prayer. There's no bait and switch. There's no frills. We simply want to get the Word of God into their hands and into their ears. And we trust the Holy Spirit with the results. And finally, we never go without earnest prayer. We pray before we outreach, we pray during an outreach, and we pray after an outreach. We have about 40 people on an email prayer list that goes out uh, usually weekly. And then, of course, all the churches uh, that are involved, Pineland included, um, is faithfully praying uh, for us, and we're very thankful for that. So just uh, to finish, I was asked how we can how you guys can be praying for this ministry. Um, Well, ultimately, I would say uh, pray for uh, a great work of the Spirit of God in our communities uh, because that is ultimately what we need. We need God to pour out his Spirit uh, on the people uh, that we're living around. Um, So I'll say pray for continued freedom. Um, Like I said, we've had amazing favor in the community with uh, with police, uh, with security, never, never an issue. Uh, so God has allowed uh, his word to go forth, and, and we're so thankful for that. Uh, how long that'll last, we're not sure. Um, so continue to pray for freedom. Uh, pray for protection, uh, particularly in Hamilton. Uh, people do threaten us. We have been threatened physically. Um, there's just a lot that goes on in that, so we'd ask for your uh, continued Uh, prayers for protection Uh, to pray for the continued unity of the team Uh, we have enjoyed um, great favor in that regard and and many of the people that have come uh, to join us um, have just I feel like I didn't even uh, really play much of a role in it they came and they were so um they were so hungry for God and so on fire, and, and they were people that had vibrant spiritual lives, and they knew it was just like a duck in the water. Just let's join together and, and go. So um, very, very thankful for that and, and the people that God has brought. And uh, I, I ask for your prayers, uh, as God calls us to, to, to pray for more laborers, um, to pray for not only for our church, for laborers, for fellow churches, but for all uh, like-minded Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches in the community. Uh, there are many, but uh, we are in need of, of revival and zeal uh, for missions locally. Um, like I said, we all have a part to play, and by no means this was meant to feel like you need to participate uh, in, in a street ministry. Um, but we do need to remember that we are called uh, to be Christ's witnesses uh, locally. So that's uh, my prayer requests, and um, I thank you for your time, and, and uh, do pray that, uh, that you were blessed. Let me, let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and for what you've done. We thank you, O oh God, that you have rescued us from darkness. We thank you uh, that you have blessed us with all the riches that are in Christ Jesus. God, we desire um, that you would be as gracious to those outside these walls of you as you have been uh, to us inside these walls. Lord, we pray that you would continue to give us a hunger and a desire and boldness, Lord, to make Jesus Christ known. Uh, in our communities. We pray as well uh, for all we have learned and heard about global missions. And God, we do pray your blessing upon our missionaries um, that are involved in that. God, and we pray that uh, you would be near to them as they are uh, far from us. Uh, May they know of our love and our care of them. So as we continue before you, O Lord, we pray that you would be glorified and that we would be sanctified. In your name we pray, amen.